So let's talk about asynchronous code. In iOS application, asynchronous code is basically everywhere because there are just so many APIs that rely on it. For instance, URL session, or NS timer, or MK local search, or NS operation, and there could be many more. There's just not enough room on the slide for all of them. And in Swift, the most idiomatic way to interact with an asynchronous API is through what's called completion handlers. So completion handlers, they are functions passed as arguments, and they will be called later when the data is ready. So they take the data as their argument. OK. So the nice thing is that it's pretty easy in Swift to write a completion handler. It looks like this. OK. So you're calling your function. You're writing the, the handler. Thanks to the trolling closure syntax, it looks really clean. And then you use the data. You run your business logic on the data. OK. This is perfect. End of the talk, right? No. Because, oh, we've captured self. And when you're an iOS developer, you know, like, this is a danger zone. Because that's how you can get a retain cycle. So if you don't know what it is, a retain cycle is like this. You have an object. This object either directly or indirectly retains a closure. The closure retains the object. And this way, in memory, you have a cycle. And this is how you get a memory leak. So this is definitely not what we want in our application. But we are good developers, so we know how to solve the issue. We just write a capture list. We say weak self, which means we are going to get a weak instance of self. So if the object is still around in memory, we'll get an instance. If it is not, we will get nil. OK, but this code doesn't compile, because now self is optional. So we need to add a question mark. OK, now it works. But there are many times where we actually don't want an optional self. We want the real deal. So OK, now we have a non-optional version, but we need to write guard let self equal self else return. So just look at all this boilerplate and just remember like how clean it was at the beginning. I mean, this is sad. <laughs> this is sad. But we are smart, so we can do better. OK, we can do better. We want to do better. Where do we start? Well, the boilerplate is in the completion handler, so we're going to start there. So what do we know about it? So by, by definition, by nature, completion handler is very generic. But we know one thing. We know that it's a function. That's a starting point. OK. What do we know about functions in Swift? Well, if you've ever seen or read anything about Swift, you've definitely seen this. People saying functions are first class citizens in Swift. OK. It's a nice sentence. But what does it mean? Well, it means three things. First, it means functions, they can be stored in variables, like this. They can also be passed as argument. We are all familiar with the map function, for instance. And it also means a third thing, which is maybe a little bit less natural, but it means that functions can return other functions, like this. So let's put this together. A function can take a function as its argument and can also return a function. So basically, we can build a function that is going to enhance another function. So it sounds really like abstract. So we are going to immediately take a look at how this might work. So this is when I need your attention, because code is going to start popping up. So let's start easy. We write a protocol. We call it Wikifiable. OK. It has one requirement, is that it can only be implemented by reference type, which makes sense, because only reference type can create written cycle and have this notion of strong and weak. OK. Then, for an extension, we make every NS object conform to this protocol. It works because there is nothing, no, like, no method to be implemented. The only requirement is to be a reference type. NS object is a reference type. OK. Now we can start writing some actual code, some actual behavior. So we make an extension on Wikifiable. And we write this method signature. We write a function called Wikify. We can see it as an argument and a return value. So let's take a look. So the argument is a function that takes an instance of self and returns void. OK. And the return value is a function that takes no argument and returns void. So just by looking at the signature, we can see what we are doing. We are going to take as input a function that wants to use self. We are going to somehow provide the value for self. And we will return a function that doesn't need to know how self is provided. This function we are going to return is going to be compatible with an API that, ex accept, that expects this signature. So we said we are going to return a function 
from void to void. So that's what we write. Return a function. OK. Now remember, Wikifiable is for reference types, so it's perfectly legal to write weak self. So we are capturing a weak instance of self. Then we write the boilerplate in order to make sure that the value is still in memory. And if it is, well, we just call the closure that we've been given as a parameter. And that's it. Now, most of the time, of course, our handlers, they also want to get arguments. They don't want to just have self. They want some value. So we write the version with one argument. Very similar. We can see we just need to add a template for a generic type. Just the closure is going to take both an instance of t and the instance of self. And inside, we just pass the value around. So same ID. Of course, we would write the same version for two, three, four, etc. number of arguments. OK, so we've implemented this. Now let's use it. So remember all of this? Now we can simplify it a lot. It just becomes this. It's very declarative because we, we say, OK, I want to wikify this closure. In the closure, we say, I expect my data and also expect a strong instance of self. We use the strong instance. And that's just no more boilerplate. Pretty cool, right? OK. Let's take some time to like, reflect on what we've just achieved. This wikify, it's a function, but it's a particular function, because it's a function that enhances a piece of code. So we could call it a pseudo keyword, because the way we use it is very similar to a built-in language keyword, except that we've made it ourselves, which means it is really like, tailored to our needs, which is pretty cool. OK, so what kind of other keyword could we implement? So there are many choices, but there is not an infinite amount of, of time. So let's pick one. It's debouncing. So debouncing, you've probably used it already, even though you might not be familiar with the, ter the term. Basically, debouncing is waiting for a given time span to elapse before performing an action. And any new call during that, temp that time frame is going to reset the timer. So two use cases you've probably encountered. First one is your user is typing into a search field. Well, you don't want to fire a network request for every character because like, it gets like, canceled immediately. You want to wait for a small time until the user has stopped typing because before you fire a request. Well, this is a use case where you are debouncing. Also, imagine that your user is scrolling a scroll view and you want to send some analytics to know how he behaves. Of course, you don't want to fire analytics for every pixel of scrolling. You want to wait until the scrolling has completed. So debouncing is very useful. Well, we can also implement it in a much declarative way for a keyword. So let's look for a pseudo keyword. So let's look at how it might go. So it would be called debounced, and it's going to take three parameters. The first one is the delay. Like I said, debouncing, it involves a notion of a timer. We give it a default value to make the ergonomics better, it's 300 milliseconds, which is usually a good value. It also needs a queue to run on. By default, it's going to be the main queue. And finally, it needs the action, the actual behavior that we want to debounce, so firing a network request, sending a hit to an analytics, this kind of thing. And we are just going to return a function from void to void. OK, so inside, we're going to find some state. We are going to implement this using the dispatch API, so we are going to have a work item, which is a dispatch work item. Then we said we return a function, so let's return a function. And what we are going to do is, if we've already created a work item, we cancel it. This way we reset the timer. Then we create a new work item, and we just schedule it. And of course, if we want to have some arguments, like the offset of a table view or the input of a text field, we write the version where we have this data. And you can see that almost nothing changes. We just basically like make the argument flow through the code, but the logic doesn't change. OK, so once again, let's use it. So let's say we have a view controller. And let's say we want to do this logic of sending an analytics when the user has stopped scrolling. So there is some logic in the view controller. Then we are going to implement a did scroll angler, so it's a function. It takes as an input the scroll view. And to keep things simple, we're just going to print at the console the offset. Now we just add the pseudo keyword. You can see that it really feels like a normal keyword. I mean, if it was in blue, you could have been confused. You could have been, what? Is it 5.2? No, it's not. And then we implement the delegate. And in the delegate, we just call our handler. 
And once again, that's it. Sudo keyword. So now, if you've been following up with Swift, you might be thinking, hmm, but isn't there a built-in way in Swift to support these sudo keywords? You know, a little something called property wrappers. It's part of this little framework called Swift UI, like the ad state there. So yeah, in Swift, we have property wrappers, and we could definitely implement stuff like that. I mean, it would be pretty cool if we could have in our code such a syntax. So let's see how it goes. So we start by implementing a strike called debounced. Then inside this strike, we're going to store some state. So it's very similar to the argument that our function took just before. So there is the delay, the queue, and the action. Then we define an init where we get some of the parameters, so the delay and the queue. We just assign it member-wise. Then to make it into a property wrapper, we just need to add this annotation, at property wrapper. Now the compiler is going to complain because we need to implement what is called a wrapped value. This is what the property wrapper basically returns. So it has a getter and a setter. It's a computed property. So the getter is pretty simple. We just return the action. And everything is going to happen in the setter. So in the setter, we create, just like before, a local variable, which is the work item. And then we set our action that is stored in the state of the wrapper. So the action is a function. We capture the queue and the delay. And then we do just like before. We cancel the item, we create a new item, and we schedule it on the queue. And that's it. Just with this, we are now able to write this kind of code. So that's pretty cool. It's time for the conclusion. OK. So in conclusion, what can you take away from this talk? Well, first, functional programming is definitely a powerful tool. We've seen that we are able to like create things that look like native keywords, except they're not, but they behave kind of like it. And we've made them ourselves out of thin air. So yeah, functional programming, definitely there for us. Then I've only shown you like what? Curious cases, Wikify, and Debounce. But I'm sure there are many more that can be implemented in your project and your code base. And now that you know about this, I'm sure that you're going to find use cases. There are some examples on the web. For instance, there is a guy on GitHub. He implemented the whole async await way to deal with asynchronous code using this technique. So it's something you could think must be built into the language. Turns out you can implement it with this technique maybe in a less optimized way than if it were built into the language, but still, you can do it, so it's powerful. Now, nice things should also be appreciated, but never abused. It's kind of like overloading operators. It's nice, but you need to use it reasonably. For things that make a lot of sense in your code, yeah, you can definitely use it. Like weak instances, it's everywhere, so it makes sense. But uh, if you start to use it everywhere, your code is going to look like a mess very fast. So once again, you need to exercise like judgment. It's software engineering, so you need to think about trade-off. If you see that you're going to use it consistently in every part of your app, go for it. If it's just a gimmick, maybe don't do it. You're just going to hurt yourself. And finally, well, property wrappers. They're the new addition to Swift, and they are just so full of potential. Just can't wait to see what we're going to get in the next releases. Thank you for your attention.